Dan Willis served with the US Navy for four years. He had a top secret crypto clearance level 14 where he could handle sensitive material. He was a disclosure project witness in 2001 and he has studied the top 10 psychological operation strategies used by the deep state to hide the truth of advanced technologies, extraterrestrial visitation, and how our planet has been kept in bondage for decades. You are listening to Exopolitics Today with Dr. Michael Sala, your source for the uncensored truth regarding the human, extraterrestrial, global, and political agenda. Click the like button and subscribe to this channel. And now, here's Dr. Michael Sala. Great to have you back on Exopolitics today, Dan. Michael, always a pleasure to join you, and especially uh, talking about the topic that we're going to talk about today. Well, it is a very interesting topic, and also, I mean, we actually have to elevate it in terms of uh, importance because, I mean, this year, uh, the World Economic Forum met in Davos, Switzerland, and, and they zeroed in on the top global threat facing humanity and it, and it wasn't global warming it, it wasn't terrorism or anything like that it was according to the world economic forum disinformation so how do you react to that well disinformation <laughs> is uh, is their biggest threat because the disinformation that they label disinformation is the public sharing information that is contrary to the official narrative that is being put out and that official narrative only serves a hidden agenda and so when people come up with anything that's conflicting with the official narrative they label it as dangerous misinformation uh and we see that across the board on on several different topics. So the, the World Economic Forum, the, the power elite, they want to push out this new narrative that uh, disinformation is the great global threat. And yet we know that there have been a number of psychological operations that have been conducted to hide the truth about you know, the whole UFO topic and uh, advanced technologies, extraterrestrial visitation and so forth. So, uh, you know, I, I know you serve with the US Navy and I know psychological operations are part of the standard military operating practice. So in terms of, you know, what is a psychological operation and, and how is how does that connect to disinformation? Well, a psychological operation <clears throat> is one where you gain the target, whether it be an enemy or even the civilians, that uh, you, you basically control their perceptions toward a hidden agenda that, uh, you know, in, 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 in war, in the military, the first thing they attack is the communications they take out the communications tower or in vietnam where i served uh in combat action the the, the radio men is the first <laughs> first person they take out because if you can take out communications um then you have a psychological advantage to um you know control the uh con to control the narrative you know they they in the old times, they'd throw leaflets out of airplanes, you know, to say, oh, this is this is the way it is. Don't pay attention to those broadcasts, <laughs> you know. Um, so it's basically, uh, basically to gain the control, the perceptions of the public to support a hidden agenda. So in terms of uh, understanding these, these terms, disinformation, and maybe say misinformation. Yeah, how, how would you explain to someone what what is the difference between disinformation and misinformation? Well, misinformation is like your um, it, it's like what you're what you're giving isn't quite accurate. You know, it's like it's misinformation. It's missing the point. Uh, 
uh, disinformation is like a purposeful um, a purposeful psyop, you could say, that uh, has has an objective to it that is is based on uh, based on a lie. Okay, that's that's helpful to know. So I, I, I think it was it Walter Cronkite that said that uh, people that don't read newspapers are uh, uninformed. Those that read the major newspapers are misinformed. <laughs> so, so where does that leave us? I mean, where do we go? <laughs> well, this is why, you know, it and, until the internet came about, um, people only had, you know, newspapers to go by. Uh, now that we have alternative media, such as your channel, Michael, um, people have other sources of information to compare. And now uh, this has become a, a great threat to those who are the gatekeepers of, of the hidden truth that want to control the population toward an agenda. We are the biggest threat to them because we are sharing information outside of their uh, control network. Okay, so now we understand a little better what the World Economic Forum is all about with its, uh, you know, new agenda of, uh, you know, attacking global disinformation. They're, they're really going after us, the the alternative media that, you know, we are a thorn in their narrative and their their goals. And so, yeah, according to them, we need to be removed. And, and our agenda, of course, is to expose what they've been doing and how they've been doing it especially when it comes to the whole exopolitics topic. And we're the biggest threat to their agenda, the truth. <laughs> right. Well, I know you've been working for decades on researching the truth and you've, you know, you've got uh, your, your website where, I, and I think the last time we talked, we went through some of the chronology of uh, some of the ET related projects, but now you're going to walk us through the top 10 or the, the, the 10 most uh, relevant psychological operations that you believe are operating today that, that are relevant to this exopolitics topic? Well, I'm not sure if I'd classify them as the top 10. I may have missed one or two. <laughs> mm -hmm. As uh, these are the ones that kind of stood out to me, you know, as you are born on this planet and you go through school and you watch television with your parents and so forth, you know, your perception of reality and, and the history books that you learned uh, form your view of the world. And what you find out is later in life that uh, most of what you've learned is a lie and that uh, a whole nother reality exists. And the, the thing that's wonderful is that uh, the glitches in this reality matrix reveal what that truth is. And there's fortunately, there's a lot of leaked, authenticated, classified documents. There's many witnesses that you've interviewed. And uh, all of these indicate that this, uh, this hidden reality that's been purposely um, purposely hidden from the public. And so um, I would call these uh, psychological operations or psyops. So let's go through your your list of 10 psyops that you, that kind of stand out for you as particularly relevant to this topic. Sounds good, Michael. <laughs> mm. Get a little water here. Um, psychological operations are the planned use of propaganda, and the primary purpose is to influence the public, to control their basic perceptions, to hide the hidden agenda. Um, a little on my background, as you know, I was a top secret military witness that testified back in 2001. Each one of us stated we're willing to testify under oath. Uh, the 21 witnesses were exposing the uh, illegal secret government operations and the extraterrestrial presence. Uh, PSYOP topic number one. Um, we won the war. We had ticker tape parades, <laughs> you know, against the Nazis, victorious. Everybody was 
you know, weary of the war. And this was the, the best news, what they wanted to hear, too. They didn't want to hear about the other elements that are going on such as the uh, Nazis were able to gain advanced technology because of an alliance with the Draco of the Sikhar Empire somewhere around 1933. Um, and then by 1934, they had achieved anti-gravity flight. Um, they had a, there was documents that before the end of the war that showed that they had this plan to infiltrate into the United States and create this matrix of perception. They called it Weltanschauungskrieg, which translates to worldview warfare in order to uh, hide their secret operations. Now, Alan Dulles is instrumental throughout this entire <laughs> situation of um, basically assisting in this infiltration. Uh, Tr President Truman was very afraid of the uh, the Soviets. And so General Major Reinhard Gellin, head of Nazi intelligence, they had the microfilm intelligence buried away in the uh, Bavarian mountains that they used as a trading chip in order to uh, bring in thousands of Nazi spies into the OSS, which turned into today's CIA. Uh, Dallas also ordered the dossiers of many Nazis that were once considered to be a, a threat to the security of the United States, have them completely cleansed of all the references, uh, which was totally against Truman's policy. Uh, now, in order to, it seems like the winner of every war, they have the history books rewritten. Um, the Rockefeller Foundation, working in alliance with the Nazis, completely rewrote a lot of elements of World War II to hide this uh, escape and infiltration. So school children in the future, you know, would have no idea and be able to put this together. They do this through generational indoctrination. An interesting thing is that uh, under Project Paperclip, Xavier Dorsch, who is Nazi Germany's top underground base expert, they started tunneling in the mountains of New Mexico, these deep underground military bases, which they established a network uh, throughout the United States. Now, this advanced technology was able to be used against Admiral Byrd's complete military armada, which he said was the nature of going down there, was military in nature, in Operation High Jump, where James Forrestal sent him down there to attack the Nazi base, where all their aircraft was completely defeated because they had anti-gravity craft and directed energy weapons. Well, you know, let's, so let, I just wanted to kind of like, yeah, look, look at that Operation High Jump, because I, I think you're absolutely correct that... Um, you know, that the big lie was that uh, the Allies won World War II and that Nazi Germany had been comprehensively defeated. And I think what really gave power to that lie was that both uh, the Allied powers, uh, the US, uh, you know, Western Europe, Britain, Canada and so forth, as well as uh, the Soviet Union, both for very for very similar reasons, didn't want their respective publics to know the truth that uh, uh, that not only had the Nazis been able to uh, get a significant proportion or a significant number of scientists, uh, personnel, and advanced technologies to Antarctica, but that they that they actually had these wonder weapons. That the wonder weapons were, were not a joke because because I, I remember. Uh, you know, that was part of the World War II. Like uh, Hitler was promising these wonder weapons, and in the end, the wonder weapons never materialized. But the 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 truth is that the wonder weapons were all sent to Antarctica, and that they mm -hmm. the, they were deployed for Operation against Operation High Jump. So so when you when you look at the end of the Second World War, Hitler's promising these the wonder weapons. Uh, they, they were never deployed. Uh, the Nazis appeared to suffer this devastating defeat, but the, a significant proportion got to Antarctica with these wonder weapons. And by the time 
the allies, uh, you know, the United Kingdom, the US, and other powers launched Operation High Jump. Uh, they were ready, and as you said, the, the Nazis had help from these extraterrestrials. So yeah, that that to me is like that's a massive lie. And and I guess again, the psychological operation there is like, yeah, we won the Second World War, the Nazis were defeated, and Operation High Jump was really just to go there and map out Antarctica so we could build bases without uh, interfering with the penguins, and, <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> Yeah, the uh, both the Soviets and the Americans wanted to grab up all these Nazi scientists and everything because they knew they were so far advanced and the stuff they had left over that they didn't take to Antarctica with them was just the the scraps, the leftovers of uh, you know the stuff that wasn't fully developed. So so true, Michael. Okay, um, let's see what we got. Roswell crash, uh, as our dear friend Elena said, this was a Trojan horse, basically, uh, by the Nibu. That's why uh, General Corso said these, these, these look like clones of uh, basically the, uh, the gray type extraterrestrials that, uh, you know, the generals were kind of drooling over this technology. And uh, this is enticing them for, uh, you know, giving him a, a way to bargain for future technology. Now, two months after uh, this, all of these three operations get formed at the same time. The Central Intelligence Agency, the Department of the Air Force, and the original Majestic 12 group that was headed by uh, Admiral Roscoe Hillencotter, who warned about the dangers of secrecy behind this, that, uh, well, he was right, <laughs> that it could be used. Um, and they, sh they show, uh, they flex their muscles and do a show of force, you know, flying over the Capitol building in 1952, and uh, our media is trying to explain it away. Uh, the CIA, of course, uh, brings in the Robinson panel to, oh, there's no such thing to this reality and everything. And here's uh, uh, Einstein in his bathrobe. <laughs> you know. Right. Well, I just wanted to comment about that 1953 Robinson panel. So if we go back to that. Yes. Uh, because that is very important because that is when... Uh, I mean, you actually have the report from the Robinson panel, and that report actually advocated an education program for the general public where the major media, Hollywood, uh, the radio industry would all be used to debunk the flying saucer uh, phenomenon that the public would be told that there was nothing behind this flying saucer phenomenon and that actually... It was being used by America's enemies, that is the, the Warsaw Pact, the Soviet Union, that they would use Americans' uh, belief or gullibility in the flying source of phenomenon to uh, undermine uh, national unity and cohesion. So they actually, through the Robinson panel, which, as you, as you pointed out, was sponsored by the CIA, actually laid the foundations for, for decades of public publicly ridiculing and debunking any scientists, any professional that talked about uh, flying saucers, UFOs as being extraterrestrial in origin as actually aiding and abetting Soviet propaganda. And so, you know, that was a big factor in why it was that for decades, no academics, very few professionals risked their careers because to do it was suicide. Oh, yeah. Uh, the Robinson panel was a classic uh, uh, psyop to, uh, they wanted to keep this out of the public's mind. It's interesting, some of the conclusions they come to was, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, is that scientists, if they came out with advanced technology, it would destroy their long pet theories of how science works and, and that the... Uh, Religious community, uh, it would uh, upset the religious community. And, you know, all these different, uh, you know, very lame uh, 
reasons to uh, deny this truth from to the uh, to the public. Um, okay, a big event happens. Uh, Eisenhower meets the Galactic Federation of Worlds. One of the witnesses there, Gerald Light, he stated it was his conviction in a letter that uh, Eisenhower planned on going on radio and television May that year and disclosed uh, this to the public. But uh, MJ-12, headed by none other than Alan Dulles, MJ-1, they wanted that technology. And, uh, and so what they did was they basically sold out our planet by to get this technology, allowing the Nibu Greys to abduct millions of our citizens for their hybrid program. They gave them underground facilities and this was a this was a uh, a way to invade our planet in a workaround around the prime directive uh, that they were attempting to do that failed. Well, I just wanted oh go, yeah go to the next slide. I, yeah, please. Okay, uh, 1955. This was a uh, is February of 55. Um, President Eisenhower, at this point, he lost control to the Nazi Draco Orion Alliance. And from this point forward, every single president, CIA director, heads of intelligence, doesn't matter who you are, denied access. And that's how I became involved in the disclosure event in 2001. And because if you look back, uh, President Eisenhower, they denied him access to Area 51. He was only allowed to send two CIA agents to report. Um, JFK, uh, after he sent the memo, he was with extreme prejudice, denied access. You have President Carter, who made his campaign promise to release the UFO files, was uh, denied by CIA Director Bush Sr. Uh, you have uh, President Clinton, who uh, stated to White House correspondent, Sarah, there's a secret government in the government, and I don't control it regarding why he can't disclose the matter. He had a CIA director, James Woolsey, in 1993, who brought in Dr. Stephen Greer since he couldn't get uh, information through any of his channels. And uh, he says, you know, I, I know the subject's real. I'm trying to figure out why the hell I can't gain access to it. And then so Dr. Greer started collecting witnesses. That's how I became involved. And then when Admiral Wilson was not only denied access, but he was threatened that he would lose rank and see an early retirement if he didn't drop the matter immediately, he told Dr. Greer, if you can get your witnesses that you've collected, which is going back to 1993, this is 1997, you have my permission to go to the mainstream media and expose these illegal operations. And so that's what brought about the event that I participated in. Well, I wanted to uh, talk about uh, those meetings because um, you know, we, we're focusing on psychological operations. And right here you have a really big one. Um, and, of course, uh, any scientist uh, that is interested in this uh, issue of extraterrestrial life i mean they're always told of you know they're always told well the, the fermi par paradox that enrico fermi one of the guys uh, that was involved in the development of the atomic bomb he asked the question well you know if um if if aliens are out there if alien civilizations exist somewhere out there well where are they i mean if if, if there's life out there it should be here. We should be seeing it. So because mm -hmm. we're not seeing it, then uh, there's no evidence that there's extraterrestrial life. And, and this is something that was being purposely put out uh, throughout this period when at the, precisely that time you have uh, President Eisenhower travelling to these military bases, Edwards Air Force Base in 54. Uh, you have... Uh, Holloman Air Force Base in 55, actually meeting with 
uh, extraterrestrial representatives and ambassadors and agreements were being reached and bases were then being built and resources shared and all of that. And all the time you, you have Enrico Fermi and you have all of these uh, debunkers some of them were, were paid debunkers like uh, uh, Professor Menzel uh, from mm. Harvard University that was part of the Majestic 12. I mean, his job was to, I mean, look, at the, mm. the sheer hypocrisy, his job was... He was an MJ-12 member too. <laughs> correct. He was an MJ-12 member and his job was to disinform uh, the, the public saying, well, if extraterrestrials are out there, well, where's the evidence? You know, the Enrico Fermi, the Fermi paradox. And of course... He, being a member of Projective uh, Majestic 12, knows about or was briefed about these meetings with these extraterrestrials arriving at bases. So, you know, you think of the massive lie there. On the one hand, you're having these meetings, galactic diplomacy, agreements are reached. And on the other hand, you're having your spokespeople go out to the general public saying, well, you know, if ETs are out there, you know, where are they? They should be showing up. Where are they? Fermi paradox. It's... Yeah, and all the scientists, even today, decades later, are still regurgitating the Fermi paradox as though this is some great truth and revelation. But in fact, it was a lie from the beginning. Right, right. You know, for decades, I was wondering, you know, well, why don't they just, you know, present themselves to us? You know, I had no idea. See, what happened was MJ-12 took full advantage of the prime directive they knew that they could not intervene with our civilization so they took full advantage of that and uh and used the psyops in order to say oh there is there is no um there is no extraterrestrial life uh that's all you know hogwash and swamp gas and everything <laughs> okay moving along now, we know Eisenhower attempted to, he knew that the Fourth Reich had in, infiltrated the military industrial complex. And uh, as, uh, you know, General Lovkin was on his staff, you know, that he had lost control to the corporations, that uh, he tried to cryptically warn about the misplaced powers and warranted influences, that to take nothing for granted, that only an alert, knowledgeable citizenry, that's all your, all your viewers out there, uh, could protect our future liberties. Oh, here's here's an interesting one. You know, there's uh, history channels and all these different outlets, you know, say, oh, Hitler died in the bunker and they have all these specials and everything like that. Um, and Heinrich Himmler, he uh, crunched down on the cyanide cap and committed suicide, which he said he never would. Um, the problem is the JFK files didn't get released until the year 2017. This was because George Bush Sr. put a 25-year secrecy order on it. And in the JFK files, it implicates George H.W. Bush as well as Lyndon B. Johnson, uh, you know, besides Alan Dulles, in the assassination of uh, JFK. But uh, in the files, it shows that uh, there's a report showing Hitler was alive and well in South America in 1955. And then the double of Himmler, who took the cyanide cap, Himmler had a dueling scar uh, on his left cheek. The doppelganger did not have that scar, and they both escaped. I think it's worth um, mentioning at, at this point that... Um, uh, Hitler and Himmler, even though they escaped to South America, that the Fourth Reich didn't give them leadership roles, that the Fourth Reich that was kind of like based out mm -hmm. of this kind of uh, secret space program set up in Antarctica, like looked at Hitler as, as someone who had like bungled the war, mm -hmm. but yet but yet they... they they understood that a lot of these Nazi SS people were fanatic Nazis. And so they kind of gave him a, you know, a nice villa to retire to and Himmler as well to retire to in South America. But they never gave them leadership positions and, and that the uh, Fourth Reich operations out of Antarctica 
were run by these you know, these secret societies right true yeah yeah they uh, they didn't go along with <laughs> hitler's I ideologies um let's see and, and this is interesting you know uh not many people brought this up but uh in 1960 president eisenhower flies all the way down to Bariloche, argentina which is way down there um, you know, when you consider that Hitler is alive <laughs> in uh, most likely his Nazi hideout down there, uh, you know, did he travel there simply for fostering relations with uh, President Frondanzi, or was this just a cover story for Eisenhower actually having a meeting with Hitler? You know, there's no evidence or proof, but it seems as though um, if Hitler is alive, and down there, and Eisenhower flew all the way down there, that possibility is, you know, it exists. Uh, I think, uh, isn't there also stories about you know, that area, Bariloche, that there are tunnels, underground tunnels, that connect that area with Antarctica. So if you've got this secret space program op operating out of Antarctica, uh, the Nachtwaffen or the Dark Fleet, whatever name you give it, mm -hmm. and it has its leadership down there. That uh, Bariloche would be a very convenient place because you could you you could have your personnel going back and forth between Bariloche. So Bariloche was, was maybe not so much that Hitler uh, played the kind of like maybe maybe he was like a, a figurehead that could be rolled out maybe to embarrass Eisenhower. <laughs> I think <laughs> the Nazis wouldn't have been beyond that, I think. But but the real business, the real negotiations would have been with the, uh, the, the Fourth Reich operating out of Antarctica. Oh, it was very, very Nazi-friendly area, and it's like a little Bavarian village down there. And, um, yeah, um, absolutely, I agree, Michael. Okay, um, the Space Brothers from Venus that uh, George Adamski meets with in 1952. Um, <laughs> okay, um, okay, we know MJ-12. Well, well, uh, Dan, yes. maybe you back up there. And I yes. just wanted to clarify, you know, so so what was the PSYOP here with George Adamski um, visiting the Space Brothers from Venus? What, what was the PSYOP? Well, um, they wanted to, as, we, as we'll see as we go into the slides, they wanted to make it appear that any of these flying discs that you see flying around are, are from are extraterrestrials that are from Venus. And what this would do is effectively obscure or hide the fact that these are from the advanced uh, technologies of the German space program. And so this was a psychological operation to divert the attention to being extraterrestrial rather than German. I see. Okay. I guess you, your next slides go into that. Is that right? Yep. Okay. Oh, perfect. Hey, MJ-12 made extreme efforts to keep the Nazi secret space program and the extraterrestrial presence uh, secret from the public. They used psychological warfare and even murder. Uh, as we know, James Forrestal, who sent Admiral Byrd down and was defeated, he wanted the public to know about the uh, German space program and the extraterrestrial presence. MJ-12 apparently were responsible for murdering him, as the annex report, uh, quote, the untimely death of Secretary Forrestal was deemed necessary and regrettable. So they threw him out the hospital window and as... Uh, Daniel uh, Slater said, you know, he, he never made it out alive. Now, the Vatican uh, was in full support of the Nazis, as you know. They worked in coordination with MJ-12 and the CIA. They issued thousands of passports to the Nazis in order to help them escape to South America. You can see some of the intelligence bulletin talking about the Nazis, the Vatican, the CIA, and all doing the uh, Heil Hitler, you know. 
Um, now, thankfully, we have these documents that uh, show the relationship of our government working with the Vatican. Uh, 1952, this uh, one top secret majestic annual report talks about, uh, it says, quote, at the request of panel member Cardinal Francis Spellman. Now, Cardinal Francis Spellman was a Knight of Malta, and he was called the, quote, Grand Protector. Interesting title. He met with the president to discuss the containment with the Catholic Church and its hierarchy of religious speculation if mass sightings occur. The, the Vatican was very afraid that mass sightings would occur and they wanted the government to have containment. And they said that such containment was successful during the 1947 sightings when Cardinal Spellman met with the Secretary of War on 29th of June. The president has been briefed on the defense plan for P, which was written in part by the panel member. So the, the Vatican was actually writing a defense plan because the last thing they wanted was to have mass sightings occur and they wanted to have containment on this issue. I, I just wanted to uh, kind of throw in here, I, I think it is important to emphasize that you had throughout this whole period in the 50s a, a, a lot of uh, contactees talking about uh, contacts with uh, these German-speaking extraterrestrials, right? right. That, that was the Space Brothers. That, I mean, some some of the best cases on it, there's the Reinhold Schmidt story where he meets these extraterrestrials uh, uh, that speak high German and a number of other cases. Uh, mm -hmm. There was also this case where a, I, I think he was a command sergeant major with the Air Force in Hawaii, and, and he saw a spacecraft land, one of these kind of like uh, craft, just like a Damsky. With an iron cross and swastika on it, and the exactly. pilot had a, a Nazi uniform. Uh, Space Brothers, yeah. right? <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. That's it. That, that, they, that they, were, they were like getting the, disinforming the public. Again, this is another psyop that like are these sightings involved uh, the, the Space Brothers, but in fact that they were involving these, uh, the, the Dark Fleet, the Nachtwaffen, uh, this German space program being run out of Antarctica and agreements were reached and they were uh, fueling these or re, uh, uh, giving them resources, manpower, and they would stop at American bases. So they stopped at this American base in in the island of Oahu uh, where they you know, were able to refuel or get resources or whatever. And I believe uh, also Diego Garcia, around that same time, the British uh, handed over Diego Garcia to the Americans. And again, the same thing, the, the, the Nakwafen ships would land. And, and of course, people who saw those were convinced that these these were the Space Brothers. Oh, yeah, MJ-12 was scrambling to try to do damage control. <laughs> you know, these people with the German accents and the swastikas on their saucers, yes. Um, it, was, it, was, it was a challenge, I'm sure. Um, after they murdered uh, James Forrestal, who was an MJ-12 member, they replaced him with another MJ-12 member, which was General Walter B. Smith, who right away writes a uh, memo to utilize the UFOs for psychological warfare. Now, this is you know one of the documents. I actually got this from the Freedom of Information Act back in the early 90s from the CIA. Um, just two months later, after General Smith, you know, talks about using it for psychological warfare. You have George Adamski coming out and claiming to the public he had contact with a being named Orthon from his spaceship from the planet Venus. The, the problem is, is that this is revealed as definitely it was a psyop because Adamski's photograph of the craft is a Nazi Hanabu craft, which I figured, you know, no one's going to know this 
but uh, what Trzinski, uh, you know, <laughs> revealed a lot of files later that uh, showed what their different uh, designs were, and so this totally, this totally uh, revealed that this was a psyop operation. Yeah, that's that comparison there is is a very important one because yeah, you know, I mean that that photo of the. Uh, Venusian spacecraft that Adamski released that came out, I guess, what 90 early 50s, 52. It something was like uh, that. December 13th of 1952. Okay, so it comes out in 52, and then Vladimir Tzitsky he released that top one, which was a schematic of, of the Hannibal 2, and that was in the 1990s, and that was from uh, the collapse of the Warsaw Pact. And Tzitsky was a member of the um, the Bulgarian Academy of Sciences, and so he was, uh, you know, with the collapse of the Warsaw Pact, all of the intelligence agencies from from Warsaw Pact members, they were all selling everything they had, and so you know this got out into the into private hands, and so there you have it, and you look at it, and it's like, well, that's an exact match for the Adamski craft. So yeah, we can say that you know, this you know, either the Adamski craft was the German space uh it was one of the part of the german space program or that the uh, hannibal craft were modeled on some of these say venusian craft or the you know, craft built by say human looking extraterrestrials th that they use that as the prototype yeah yeah but highly unlikely <laughs> yeah. well uh, on that on that issue uh william tompkins he did say that what the Draco did was that they gave the Nazis all of these operational prototypes of craft and, like, mm -hmm. he ga they gave them to them and said, you work it out. So, you know, so it's possible that the Draco had some of these captured craft. Maybe this was like, a, you know, maybe a Federation craft that had been captured and handed it over to the Nazis and said, hey, this build this. <laughs> you know, so, so, yeah, Tompkins did say that. Yeah. Well, over time, lies. <laughs> it takes it takes a couple of decades sometimes, but lies get exposed. You know, over mm -hmm. time. Um, you know, it's interesting that Zamsky was every time he had a contact, the U.S. Air Force flew him to the Pentagon, where he had a military ordnance ID card, which allowed him access into the Pentagon. Uh, in 1952, the Pentagon was well aware of the German space program had survived. And uh, it was flying over U.S. territory, and they wanted this kept secret. So any reference to the German origin, such as Kraft, was you know thoroughly downplayed. Instead, it was you know diverted to references to extraterrestrials from Venus. And as you mentioned uh, previously, Michael um, Reinhold Schmidt, uh, here's them. You know, he happens to be German himself, and he hears them talking in German amongst themselves, and he says, oh, they were talking in, in high German language, and he adds, and very good high German language. <laughs> and uh, we have, uh, earlier we have Willard, <clears throat> that you mentioned, and the swastika, and Iron Cross, and the pilots wearing a German Nazi uniform. So they were, uh, once in a while, they were showing up. Now, this is interesting, you know, the relationship of the Nazis, the CIA, the MJ-12, Vatican. It seems apparently that uh, they wanted to award George Adamski for his contribution to the MJ-12 PSYOP and keeping this uh, Nazi secret space program secret. So Pope John um, the 23rd presents this gold solid gold medallion with his head embossed on it wow okay so that's that's very interesting i hadn't thought of that 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 in fact when adamski was you know given this gold medallion by the pope it was because he played a role in a kind of like a psychological operation to hide the truth about the nazis and of course talking about extraterrestrials because i mean you know you can imagine uh, you know, back in the day, if if George Adamski said was saying, "Well, I'm meeting these these beings on these spacecraft, uh, but they're Germans," 
these Germans and they come out of Antarctica. I mean, the world would have been in an uproar. But instead he said, well, these are space brothers from Venus and everyone laughed and dismissed it. So, yeah, I, I think that's very interesting what you're saying, that this Adamski was knowingly part of a psychological operation. That's very interesting. They were apparently very pleased with his efforts. Yes. Uh, yeah, I hadn't thought of that. That's uh, interesting. 1981, you know, President uh, Reagan gets a briefing, which uh, CIA Director William Casey brings him in on. Um, the briefing disclosed that the psychological program was using the media to carefully craft a public perception of the UFO phenomenon. They said, quote, the first person who helped us with this disinformation program was Mr. George Adamski back in the 50s. Interesting, this little, wow. little more confirmation. Yeah, that's, that's, imp that's impressive. I mean, that's corroboration with uh, what you were saying. That's, that's important. That's an important piece of history here that a lot of the Space Brothers stories were, in fact, officially sponsored disinformation programs to kind of like steer people away from the whole German program um, operating out of Antarctica. And they also said that the NSC, National Security Council, felt open disclosure could lead to nationwide panic if all information about UFOs and alien visitation was released, causing panic among religious leaders worldwide. Oh, my God, you know, we're, <laughs> we're, we're, we're going to have to think, change our way of thinking. The, the briefing also revealed the influence of all productions of UFO related movies, you know, you can think going all the way back to the day there stood still in 1951. This helps the public keep their minds open. Now, this is all part of, you know, seeding the collective mind since the, the whole public on the whole planet has been hoodwinked and this reality kept from them. What they've done, I think they've rationalized that if they, through science fiction, they can see these concepts, it keeps their minds open, but it also allows us to keep our secret aircraft away from the public's knowledge. So people just think, you know, it's, it's extraterrestrial. And uh, the famous quote by William Casey, we'll know our disinformation program is complete when everything the public believes is false. Now, the real <laughs> spacecraft from Venus lands in Alexandria, Virginia in 1957 with Ambassador Val Thor of the Galactic Federation of Worlds to meet with President Eisenhower. For a period of three years, he stays in a VIP status at the Pentagon to attempt to assist Eisenhower with, you know, you can imagine, with the, this complicated situation. Okay, ready to sign up number four. Well, maybe just back up to Val Thor because I think it's worth emphasizing here because, uh, you know, when we or when you proposed that a lot of these flying saucers that were being seen or the Space Brothers, that elements of that or significant elements of that were part of a psychological operation or disinformation and Adamski was... Uh, knowingly part of that that that's kind of quite a revelation but you're but what you're not saying that all of the craft were part of this disinformation to hide the truth about the the Germans that's that some of the craft were also belonging to this positive group of extraterrestrials that we call the Galactic Federation and Val Thor was was part of that so so yeah I mean I, I think it'd be mm -hmm. good to just like clarify you're not saying that all of the flying saucers that were being seen at the time were like these German craft reverse engineered That's uh, operating correct. out of Antarctica, that, that there were genuine extraterrestrials, but they were part of this galactic federation and Val Thor was part of that. That's correct. Yeah, there was, it was a mix. Um, and um, yeah, I think it was kind of rare that the... Uh, the Nazi craft, you know, show up, you know, like those two incidences back in 56 and 57. But, uh, um, but yeah, there absolutely it was, there's a real and there's the uh, made, made on earth. Yes. Uh, and on that issue, uh, one of the witnesses um, called Anonymous, this is the guy that uh, talked about 
uh, Eisenhower threatening to invade um, uh, invade the S4 facility, Area 51, mm-hmm. which S12 didn't reveal. He's, he said that his job, part of his job uh, for the CIA was to go over the data f- that they got from uh, all of the instrumentation from South America, and his job w- was to differentiate between the, the genuine mm. extraterrestrial flying saucer or spacecraft from the reverse engineered human craft so so even then the americans in the 1950s that they were they had a lot of instruments operating out of south america using whatever satellites eventually came and 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 they were focusing on trying to tell the difference between the the german flying saucer craft you know the hannibal craft coming out of antarctica and operating in the americas and the genuine extraterrestrial craft coming from off world that's a really good point michael yes i remember him uh, talking about that you know and definitely there was these two different types of uh craft from two different worlds that were uh were being monitored over there that's interesting all coming out of uh antarctica okay um Here's another, you know, Elon Musk's not going to like this one. Um, we need rockets to overcome gravity and go into space. Well, you know, my fellow witnesses, uh, each one of us, you know, including myself, we each stated in front of the 22 cameras that we're willing to testify under oath before a congressional hearing, which is penalty of perjury. Um, Mark McCandish, one of our 21 witnesses, he revealed that uh, back in 1988 at Norton Air Force Base, there was uh, a, uh, a show for high brass that's showing these what's called alien reproduction vehicles. These are the antiques that were made back in the 1950s that could go faster than the speed of light. Um, here was an um, actual military photograph of one that fits the form pretty close to the illustration that uh, my, uh, my dear friend Mark McCandish uh, drew back then. Now, <laughs> Dr. Stephen Greer, he didn't want to go to this. He said it was, this is just a kangaroo court, the citizen hearing back in 2013. And uh, I told him, well, you should go, you know. Well, he went and he did give the following saying that October 1954, Apparently, he got intelligence from somebody in the NSA that's been in the vault and said that uh, ever since October 1954, we've not needed rockets, jets, internal combustion engines, surface roadways between cities. You have to think in like back to the future, you know, where we're going, we don't need roads. Um, and so he testified uh, back in uh, 2013 about by October of 1954. Now, keep in mind, this is two decades behind Nazi Germany had operational craft in 1934, 20 years later. Now, Walt Disney, 33rd degree Freemason, along with Werner von Braun, is using television, you know, um, (laughs) Nazi friendly, uh, to uh, sell us on the idea that rocket propulsion in the future for space travel is going to overcome gravity and, you know, everything's about rockets and when they knew otherwise. Uh, 1958, NASA's created, run by a former Nazi SS officer, Dr. Kurt DeBus. And it seems that uh, the Nazi SS apparently was well aware that they figured out the torsion physics of anti-gravity, but wanted to keep us in this retarded state using primitive rockets to go into space where uh, we'd never be able to catch up with them keeping us uh, in that state. Now, publicly in 1959, uh, Dr. Hermann Oberth, who was Dr. Werner von Braun's mentor, said... Quote, we cannot take credit for the record advancement in certain scientific areas alone. We've been helped. When they asked him by whom, he said, quote, the people of other worlds. Very revealing. Well, um, just just on the kind of Nazis running the Apollo program, I mean, that 
right there you have something that you know should stand out to anyone that mm -hmm. has any kind of critical thinking why would former nazis be in charge of the <laughs> apollo program and you know i, I discussed it in a, in a couple of my books uh, but essentially that was part of the agreement that was reached between the german program or the fourth reich in antarctica and the americans that okay we agree to exchange resources and scientific know-how and and so the operation paperclip scientists began to work with the americans and and so in order to uh send to the fourth reich in antarctica massive amounts of uh, equipment resources manpower you had to hide it somehow and so they created this massive apollo program which as you said was working on this you know, not even justified to call it second rate third rate technology which is rocket propulsion right. we'll work on that you know trick the public into thinking this is the real deal while all the time you're massively funding this uh, advanced anti-gravity torsion field spacecraft projects in antarctica uh, with the germans and and you're hoping to get off the back end of that you know some of those craft and and you're building your own resources down there and all the time you, you got the rockets being pushed by these former nazis and and they're using that apollo program to as as a cover for sending billions of dollars to antarctica so you know i, I my my kind of catchphrase is that the apollo program was uh to get americans a, to a very moon. expensive prop <laughs> That's right. We get Americans to the moon and Germans to Mars and beyond. Yes, yes. It was uh, very elaborate. Um, and it seems that's the way they do things. They do these huge amounts of money to make things seem as though they're, you know, the, we're, we're doing the best we can with uh, our rocket propulsion when uh, this was a well known PSYOP. Uh, Elisa, hope 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 we can educate more more public on that anyway. All right, going into the next psyop, uh, something I've had some experience with. Uh, we need to use gasoline and these nuclear power plants and coal that's polluting and the nuclear power plants. We know of the the dangers of these dangerous, obsolete, primitive methods of, uh, but there's no real viable alternative, right? PSYOP number five. The Invention Secrecy Act has suppressed over 6,000 free energy, anti-gravity, medical, and many other inventions. Uh, it was actually called the Invention Secrecy Act of 1951 that came active in 1952. Um, now, I became involved in this because I have a, a technical background. I volunteered after the Bush administration denied the congressional hearing. We had the scientists within the unacknowledged special access programs which could prove we have zero point energy. You know, put it in front of the congressional hearing, show it operating. Uh, of course, the Bush administration denied that congressional hearing. So as an alternative, Dr. Greer set up a corporation identifying scientists. We have a database of about 300. I traveled the planet for about 10 years vetting these different over-unity type of technologies that um, here with Dr. Greer and is an inventor down in uh, the Dominican Republic that I worked with for a number of years that uh, the CIA came to his door and said, this works, you're dead. So he disassembled the whole thing. Oh, and then we have John Bedini uh, taking off uh, of a lot of Tesla's knowledge. Uh, Professor Tom Thomas Bearden I worked with, my wife helping at the lab. Uh, the U.S. Patent Office has what's called sensitive application warning system. In other words, red flag, anti-gravity, red flag, free energy, red flag, anything that um, threats the status quo, automatically the inventor gets what's called a national security order, which states that your invention has been deemed to be a detriment to the security of the United States. Therefore, you cannot share it with anybody. And anybody that you've shared it with, you've got to let us know, and they have to not to share it with anybody. So um, we brought in uh, Dr. James Schwartz onto your show one time, remember? And he had 
been issued one of these and he uh, had a number of energy inventions that had had been uh, suppressed in this manner. Here's one that um, you're a scholar on. <laughs> I love your book, uh, Kennedy's Last Stand. I highly recommend it to everybody. The Lone Gunman, Lee Harvey Oswald. He assassinated JFK. Well, um, the recovered MJ-12 documents, uh, James Jesus Angleton, I think he was, they were, it was pulled out of the burn pile and they were trying to, they were trying to get rid of all these documents and burn them. Uh, and one of them, uh, called the burn memo, uh, revealed that here we go. MJ-1, Alan Dell set up assassination directive. If, uh, if they couldn't have any more cooperation, uh, in Washington. And so President Kennedy sends a top secret memo to the CIA to release the UFO files 10 days before he's assassinated. And you can see this has got to be the worst handwriting I've ever seen, but it says Angleton has MJ directive or majestic directive. So with that uh, top secret memo, it triggered the assassination directive and was given to James Jesus Angleton, the CIA chief, chief of counterintelligence to carry out the directive. And we know that the CIA was working with the mafia and we know that uh, George Bush Sr. was involved, uh, Lyndon B. Johnson, you know, it was, a, it was a, a lot of people wanted Kennedy dead for a lot of different reasons. And the CIA with the UFO issue was uh, one of the main ones. And the Warren Commission, after all, is headed by none other than Alan Dulles, which determined that there was no conspiracy. Interestingly, uh, the Warren Commission members were mostly all 33rd degree Freemasons. And uh, uh, yes. Uh, I, well, maybe you should finish your, your presentation on Kennedy and then I'll, I'll add something. Oh, yeah. You have a lot on this one. Uh, 1967, a secret CIA dispatch labeled uh, anyone as a, this is, and they're still using this terminology today. It's very useful because they label them the conspiracy theorists. Anyone who's questioning the official narrative, they're a conspiracy theorists. And what they do is they label conspiracy theorists, oh, oh you're, you're, you're selling books or movies or you're, uh, it's, you're, you have this half-baked theory about something. It, uh, a lot of times they they try to discredit people because they say, oh, you're just trying to make money off of this and, and so forth. Uh, it's one of the reasons I've, I've never accepted any money for, for anything other than uh, the Galactic Spiritual Informers Conference that I got paid as a speaker. But all these decades, I've never accepted any money for anything. So this is how they do it, how they discredit people as a conspiracy uh, theorist. So before we go on to the moon, Michael. Yeah, I just wanted to kind of like add in there that you know, when I wrote uh, Kennedy's Last Stand in 2013, uh, I, I didn't bring in the, uh, the German aspect, the Nazi aspect, because I wasn't as familiar with it then as I am now. And, and one of the things I've discovered subsequently is that um, you know Kennedy not only pissed off the mafia I mean the Kennedy brothers but they also pissed pissed off the Germans because they wanted to expose uh, what was really going on with the whole classified UFO topic and that would have meant mm -hmm. exposing the existence of this breakaway German group down in Antarctica and so they were upset with that. And, and I think that, um, you know, Kennedy was an obstacle to uh, this agreement that had been reached between the Majestic 12 group and the Dark Fleet in Antarctica. And so as, as he kind of like uh, moved forward with his plans and, uh, you know, cooperation with the Soviet Union and Khrushchev and, and really threatened the secrecy system, that, that I think that probably the, the, the Germans in Antarctica, that they were another factor in the assassination. Uh, it's interesting, yes. Um, so, many, so many elements behind, uh, you know, about, uh, and then you have the Freemasons and the, 
you know, the, yeah, the whole thing. Um, okay, um, onward to the moon. <laughs> In 1969, we went to the moon and just got some rocks and came back as seen on television. Now, another fellow witness, uh, Carl Wolf, who also stated he'd testify under oath, before we went to the moon, the lunar orbiter who was making mosaics of the moon, both the, uh, the back side of the moon or dark side of the moon, whatever you want to call it, and the front side of the moon, they did a complete mosaic. And um, he stated in front of the cameras, he says, we discovered a base on the back side of the moon. Then he proceeded to put photographs down in front of me. And clearly in these photographs, there were structures, mushroom-shaped buildings, spherical buildings, and towers. I remember going home and naively thinking, I can't wait to hear about this on the evening news. And here it is, more than 30 years later, and this was 2001, <laughs> and I hope to hear about it tonight. And I will testify under oath before Congress that what I am saying is the truth. Uh, poor Carl Wolf, he got killed on his bicycle by a large truck. Another fellow witness, a dear friend, who uh, sent me a letter in the mail saying that she's having attempts on her life. Uh, she died of a cancer. Uh, I toured the Capitol building with her. She was 20 years at NASA, and uh, she said, I don't know how they do it. You know, she's been there for so long. Some people have no idea what's going on in the secret operations in NASA, while, you know, the other people have, have absolutely no idea of these it's like these two nasas going on she was saying that the astronauts were sworn to secrecy that they're not allowed to talk about what happened when they went to the moon and our dear friend uh william tompkins who uh was at the trw facility which was monitoring the live video feed directly from the moon that wasn't being censored and with his photographic memory, which was quite incredible, you know, because he was able to reproduce all these little ships in detail, um, he sketched the enormous alien craft that were lined up on the uh, crater edge. And then you look at this uh, image here. These are the probably the Draco, of uh, the Sakaar Empire. Um, this little black speck is the lunar module. To give you an idea of the size. Now, ham radio operators uh, bypassed NASA's censorship, myself being a ham radio operator since 1964. I had a fellow ham radio operator, uh, which I shared with you, Michael, who was actually at a military, uh, a Mars station, military affiliate radio station, that was monitoring directly with a directional antenna the transmission coming from the moon. And he said that's exactly what, what he heard, what they said. NASA was saying, What's there? Mission Control calling Apollo 11. Apollo 11 responds, These babies are huge, sir. Enormous. Oh, my God. You wouldn't believe it. I'm telling you, there's other spacecraft out there lined up on the far side of the crater edge. They're on the moon watching us. Neil Armstrong in 1994, you know, he becomes very much of a recluse after all this. Uh, you did a fantastic interview with, doc, with David Adair talking about his firsthand interaction with David Adair and about how he couldn't say what really happened. He said in a speech that there are great ideas, undiscovered, breakthroughs available to those who can remove one of truth's protective layers. And Neil Armstrong was aware of what he was hinting at. So, you know, right there, I mean, you've you've just touched on quite a number of genuine, well-credentialed whistleblowers and former astronauts, witnesses, who have been able to show that the moon actually does have um, a lot happening up there. And of, and, of course, what we have officially is that the moon is this desert-like planet or planetoid, uh, there's nothing on the surface other than craters, and that 
uh, beneath the you know you might have some seismic activities maybe a cavern here or there but it's la but that's it it's the void of of anything of, of great interest but in fact what we know from these witnesses whistleblowers that you've cited is that there are ancient facilities up there there are extraterrestrial craft up there uh, there are bases there uh, that there's an incredible amount happening there. And again, it's all hidden. This is all a, a, another massive psychological operation to make people believe that uh, the, the moon is really a, an uninteresting place. And uh, yeah, nothing to see. Let's move on. It's quite a stretch for people, as William Tompkins says. First of all, it's not a moon, and it's not our moon. And um it's it's hollow and it's a spacecraft that was put in tidal lock orbit a long time ago and um yeah it's gonna it's it's a hard one for people to imagine they think oh this is just earth's moon it's just the way it's always been but uh, no it's actually uh, kind of a um it seems like it's a um kind of like a away spaceport you know kind of like a a place to to go to to jump from to go to other places um and apparently the nebu and the draco were in full control of it until the year 2021 when they were purged out of our solar system and now the galactic federation worlds thankfully is uh in full control there okay speaking of psyops my favorite myself being an xabc newsman uh this is uh a topic i I think everybody should become familiar with the mainstream media, the news you can trust. <laughs> Though, you know, the thought is, you know, how could our media and information systems be allowed to be infiltrated by an enemy and we not know about it? And how this happens is through generational indoctrination. I remember Hitler once said, you know, give me a child uh, up to or is it seven or so that and he's mine for life it's like if you indoctrinate children at an early age and generational indoctrination over a long period of time a lie could take on a whole different form uh, through generational indoctrination spanning many decades children had grown up watching television most have innocently assumed the television networks would not have any reason to deceive you you know like walter cronkite you know um, and so have accepted the information as being reliable based on the assumption that numerous broadcast journalists are researching and vetting this information to be accurate. And surely they would, they would speak out if there was something that wasn't true and inform us, right? So we have to look back through history about the cabal, you could say, which is the, uh, the global elite with lots of money that control things. Uh, where J.P. Morgan, Rockefeller, Warburg, who is responsible for the Federal Reserve, um, they purchased the main 25 newspapers of the time, and they put their own editors in and gave the editors the information that they wanted the public to, uh, to know. So this is going back way back in 1917. And in 1921, the Council of Foreign Relations then is controlling the narrative for the media, and among the members is, guess who? <laughs> Alan Dulles. <laughs> okay, and then Alan Dulles starts Operation Mockingbird, where the CIA is paying 400 media journalists to form the public's perception. They're paying these, they're giving the script and everything. You know, when I was an ABC newsman, I would take off the teletype of American Press, United Press International, and I would read the news. And I had no idea who is forming these news reports and how the, how they're worded and so when they uh give the journalists these reports what it does is it works toward forming the public's perceptions toward an agenda 1954 uh, this is in may of 1954 when eisenhower was planning on going public instead the former nazi ss officer prince bernhard uh, sets up the yearly secret Bilderberg meetings, which they have regularly, that they, along with the, the Bilderberg, with the Council of Foreign Relations and the Trilateral Commission, 
had the uh, top executive positions of the mainstream media. Here you can see, you know, Washington Post, CNN, CBS, New Time News, Fox, all of them are with their top executive positions controlling the information. And if you're a news reporter and you don't go along with the um, <laughs> with the narrative, you get fired, you know, and replaced. Okay, the CIA realized that they needed to consolidate control. In 1983, there was 50, 50 media companies. And so what they did was they started these secret meetings, the CIA, with the heads of mainstream media in Sun Valley, Idaho, that uh, what they did was they consolidated it down from 50 to only six media corporations in order to centrally control the narrative. Now, this is their attitude. Brzezinski, who co-founded the Trilateral Commission, um, shortly the public will be unable to reason or think for themselves. They'll only be able to parrot the information they've been given on the previous night's news. And that's, that's pretty much true for a lot of people. Well, after all, you have to consider the newscasters are reading the script, they're reading on the teleprompter, like I did when I was you know, a newsman. Uh, billions of dollars go into psychological think tanks in order to form the public's perception, to gain their consent toward the agenda that's formed by the narrative. The mainstream media has such a powerful influence in its image-making ability, it can make a criminal look innocent and make the innocent look like a criminal. I saw this firsthand when we did the 2001 event where the media was doing what's called a limited hangout they weren't revealing about the illegal secret government operations or the extraterrestrial presence. Instead, the media did what's called a limited hangout by saying that we wanted to have simply a congressional hearing on the reality of UFOs. Now, CBS did a special interview with me, and I said, look, I'm not doing this interview with you unless I can say we have the scientists that can prove we have zero-point energy. They promised, flew down from Los Angeles to San Diego, where I was, interviewed me for 45 minutes. Afterwards, she said, oh, I never had this happen before, but the higher executives, and we know who they are, made me cut that part out. Jo Dr. Joseph Goebbels, who knows propaganda quite well, he said, propaganda becomes ineffective the moment we become aware of it. And that's so true, isn't it? Oh. Okay. Oh, well, I just wanted to um, touch on that, uh, the the mass media, the consolidation of the media that you, you pointed to, the Sun Valley, uh, how they got 50 major media corporations from mm -hmm. 1983 consolidated down to six by uh, the late 20, well, late well, 2020 or something like that. So, I mean, that would be... Uh, I mean, that is definitely a worrying sign, but I guess what we can take comfort from is that while the mainstream media was being consolidated in this way so that, it, so that they could more easily control mainstream media narratives, the alternative media has just blossomed. And mm. what we've seen over the last, especially uh, the last, say, five years, is that public trust in mainstream media has just plummeted while public trust in the alternative media has just skyrocketed. And, and I know myself, I mean, I look at my behaviour and maybe uh, others reflect on their behaviour. I mean, how we've changed, uh, I mean, you know, the, the mainstream media sources that once we used to go to to get our information, now we go to YouTube or we go to our Twitter feed or to our Rumble feed, we go to our favourite alternative news sites. That's how we and many millions of others are getting their news. And so, you know, in a way, on, on, you've got this kind of countervailing trend. While the elites are, like, concentrating media ownership in fewer and fewer hands, at the same time, uh, the, the public is embracing alternative media in greater and greater numbers. And, of course, you know, that's why the World Economic Forum has created, uh, has, has made... Uh, global disinformation, the number one mm -hmm. uh, priority f uh, for 2024. It's because, yeah, they want to stop this. They want to crush the uh, alternative media because, you know, they've, they've 
gone to so much effort to consolidate mainstream media and fewer and fewer hands, but fewer and fewer people are now watching it or listening to it. <laughs> so it's like, well, how can we bring the numbers back? And it's like, well, they have to crush the alternative media, but I don't, I don't see them succeeding. It reminds me of a scene out of Star Wars, Princess Leia saying to Darth Vader, the more you crowd your, your grip, the more star Jedis will slip through your fingers. <laughs> you know, it's like, a, you know, they, they try to have this iron grip and try to control it. But, uh, but you know, we're the, we're the Jedis of the alternative media. Yep, exactly. A nice metaphor. <laughs> Okay, uh, medical system. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, all doctors do this Hippocratic oath that they swear that they will not do any harm. Uh, uh, at this point, Dan, I mean, I, I need to um, just mention that uh, YouTube will take down this video if we go too far down what they consider, you know, medical. Oh, don't worry. I've, I've, I've sanitized it. <laughs> oh, very good. Yeah. So, yeah. So viewer, just be aware that this has been sanitized because we need to uh, self-censor if you're going to put stuff out on YouTube these days. Right, right. Well, you know, this is a little history of Rockefeller, um, how 1911, they found him guilty of uh, corruption, racketeering. And then by 1913, they were using philanthropy. We know certain people using philanthropy to uh, use illegal gains to take over the healthcare in the U.S. and their pharmaceutical investment business of patent drugs. And then 1918, the Spanish flu. They, uh, by this time, you know, in 1917, they controlled the, all the newspapers. Who, with their control of the media, they started this witch hunt against all natural forms of medicine that are not patentable drugs. All medical schools, this is important, all medical schools, most hospitals in the American Medical Association came under their control of the uh, Rockefeller medical monopoly by this time. And, uh, you know, my great grandfather went up against Rockefeller back in the early 1900s. He was president of the Homeopathic Medical Society. They were trying to shut down anything that was not, you know, patented drugs. Um, in 1946, the Nuremberg trials that established the international law of informed consent because of what they did. Uh, there was a, a number of pharmaceutical corporations that uh, came out from IG Farben that uh, 13, or there's probably a little bit more today, that are big pharma today. I don't say the names, you know them. Um, in 1946, uh, 1,600 former Nazi scientists, doctors, including men responsible for murder, slavery, human experimentation, eugenics, and men who never stood trial, the CDC is formed this year with many of these former Nazis. Uh, you have to think about the effects today that the uh, corporations have influenced the textbooks of the doctors, that uh, they receive absolute minimal nutritional training that uh, the third leading cause of death is after heart disease and cancer is medical mistakes in hospitals, and that uh, they influence the mainstream media, social media, search engines in order to support the uh, drug sales. Uh, Dr. Max Gerson uh, is a nutritionist who was murdered and cured my mother of cancer. Uh, my mother had level four cancer, which only radiation surgery or pharmaceuticals are legal in the U.S., so I had to take her across the border. Uh, the U.S. doctor said if I did that, that she would surely die. Regardless, I took her there. Two months later, the same doctor examined, could not find a trace of cancer in her body, and my mother lived to her, into her 90s cancer-free. Uh, Max Gerson's daughter shared with me that uh, uh, Dr. Gerson was uh, strychnine poison right after he published his book, A Cure for Cancer. Dr. Royal Raymond Reif, the scientist who discovered how to cure cancer with frequency oscillations. In 1934, Dr. Reif, before a special medical research committee with his equipment, 
was able to cure 16 terminally ill cancer patients. The organizer of the event, just hours before he was able to announce the amazing results, was fatally poisoned and his papers were lost. Uh, planet Earth. Uh, we have a global population of 8.1 billion humans on it. Um, our average human lifespan, for men anyway, is around 77 years. Advanced human-like extraterrestrial races across the galaxy are said to have an average lifespan in hundreds or even thousands of years. Why not here on our planet? And we're going into the final PSYOP. Um, there's no secret space programs with advanced medical technology. That's only science fiction. And we've only gone to the moon. And we're aware that uh, the 2001 event inspired uh, computer hacker, Gary McKinnon, who revealed on the computer systems, they wanted to put him away for 70 years in prison for this, uh, the US Navy Solar Warden secret space program. Um, I love this image, I hope you don't mind, <laughs> I borrowed it uh, from your wonderful book. Uh, the Galactic Federation of Worlds, working with the US Navy since the 1940s, helped to develop the Solar Warden space program. And they also worked with Office of Naval Intelligence to give Gene Roddenberry the script for Star Trek in order to seed the collective mind with concepts like teleportation, warp drive, wormholes, and the Prime Directive. Gratefully, uh, in 2021, our solar system has been liberated from... Well, Dan, before we go there, maybe we should just like um, talk about this existence of a secret space program, because I know uh, right now uh, there, there is a lot of people that are embracing the information coming from David Grush, um, and other whistleblowers, insiders that have been talking about the existence of these corporate programs where uh, some alien craft or craft of non-human intelligence have been recovered, they've been studied. But the narrative that's emerging uh, from a, a lot of people, not just David Grush, but also you know, people from the Soul Foundation, uh, Louis Elizondo, George Knapp, uh, uh, Dr. Eric Davis helped put off you know, a whole lineup of uh, people that are being given a lot of prominent coverage in the, in the mainstream media and have mm -hmm. big YouTube followings. They're all saying that, uh, yes, craft have been recovered, but the technology is too advanced and we haven't yet reverse engineered it. And so they're kind of putting out this information and, and you can... You can go back to the Bob Lazar days as well, where Bob Lazar said similar things. But they're saying that uh, that there's been no progress or very little progress made in reverse engineering these craft. And, of course, the information you've cited and that I've been putting out in my books is saying the reverse. So, so you know, what do you think's going on? This could be part of uh, PSYOP 10, or it could be its own category of PSYOP 11, but it's a very important one you're bringing up, Michael, because uh, there is a definite narrative of certain individuals that are brought forth on the mainstream media that are, you know, going along with this narrative that, uh, yeah, we've got some extraterrestrial craft, but it's way too, way too advanced, you know, and Bob Lazar, who I met with back in 93, and I've filmed him at a private meeting outside Area 51. Um, you know, his testimony has been 100% consistent, and I believe he's he's completely, uh, he's not compromised, he's completely valid, what he's saying, but uh, of course he's not, it's compartmentalized, of course he's not read into these other projects that have achieved, uh, like, back in the 50s, like uh, Dr. Greer testified and like uh, um, Mark McCandish testified that we've had these uh, anti-gravity craft going back into the 50s. And as uh, 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 Gary McKinnon revealed that we have a secret space program with these huge cigar-shaped craft that are 
in our solar system and, and the solar warden program. So no, they want to keep this, uh, and it seems to go along with the uh, false flag alien invasion. It seems like because uh, if as long as as long as and, and all the uh, UFO UAP Senate hearings, they're always saying, "Oh, we don't have any kind of technology like this." And you think about what happened to my dear friend Mark McCandish before he was going to testify that he was supposedly committed suicide. And then you have Mike Tuber, Air Force specialist, who retracted his whole testimony and said, oh, 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 oh no, 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 I just made the whole thing up. Uh, the Tic Tac isn't U.S. technology. And so you have all these leaks all over the place that are very embarrassing, that are trying to cover up, that they will do anything to cover these things up in order to support this narrative that we have not advanced in our technology. So that's like a, that should be nearly action number 11 and should be given a lot of attention to because there it is a... Uh, it is a, a primary psyop that you know, like Dr. Eric Davis, you know, has briefing members of Congress that, you know, oh, we haven't made much progress, but we, yes, we have reverse engineered. And it's going through the New York Times, which is the main, uh, the main, uh, uh, whatever you call for the, for the deep state cabal is the New York Times, you know. So, um, for the people who are aware of this, that this should raise all kinds of red flags when people say, we've not made any progress. I totally agree with you, Michael. Okay, moving on. I don't know how we're doing for time, but we'll get in close to the end here. Um, okay, as we know, <laughs> this advanced medical technology is able to time and age regress enlistees into the space program of which you've interviewed a number of them having total memory recall. Um, now, this medical holographic science of the medbeds, uh, it's basically, the holographic technology is based on the fact that the universe is holographic and it can be tuned through the vector of time. An individual's holographic field contains within it this time vector, which can be attuned to an earlier point in time when the body was more optimal you know, think back in your 20s or whatever, when, then this pattern can then be projected onto the body, causing the body to morph into this more optimal pattern. Now, in the 1980s, I worked with IBM's head scientists on a project that worked on a holographic camera that was able to substantiate this principle. Uh, it was patented in Paris, France in 1955. Thousands of photos were made with it. Here, as you can see, the schematic in the patent. Here's a time spiral to move forwards and backwards in time. Now, this was using a drop of blood from a woman who was pregnant. It was 50 miles away. It was tuned into the fetus. So you can see the, the form here. Now, they were able to move forwards and backwards into time to see the different gestation levels of this. So thousands of photos were made with this. My job working with Dr. Vogel was to turn this, instead of a photographic plate, which was very laborious to take a picture and you have to have it developed, it was to turn it into a real-time display. So this substantiates the reality. Although this was primitive in comparison to you know, the technology they have in the space program, it substantiated the reality that the holographic field can be tuned through in time. Um, and we have a number of witnesses, like our dear friend John Charles Moyen, who uh, was attacked on Mars by a black Draco that almost severed his body in half, and they put him on a med bed and completely restored him. He's in the French section of the Solar Warden program on the spaceship Solaris. And then our dear friend Tony Rodriguez, who is an Aquafin cargo engineer and doing many other things as well. His arm was severed and his foot, and this was completely restored after an insectoid attack on Mars. He experienced, he said he felt like a million bucks afterward. Um, our dear friend, Elena Denan, she was abducted by the Nibu Greys, thanks to uh, Alan Dulles and the MJ-12 group, uh, for their hybrid program at age nine, causing a severe complications, and she was taken in France to, to a med bed and was uh, those complications were alleviated. 
She was uh, rescued by the Galactic Federation of Worlds and the implant that the Nibus put in, they repurposed it and retuned it to be a communication device to communicate to her. Uh, with this, sh she's graciously accepted the task of being an emissary for the Galactic Federation of Worlds. Uh, it's interesting that on March 30th, 2023, Thor Han, her rescuer and contactee, took her on board his craft and they went to the moon where she actually witnessed the massive facilities inside the moon where she saw the production of thousands of these holographic med beds and other technologies that will no doubt be released at some point in the, when the timing is appropriate. Um, yeah, in my, my view of Elena, and like you, I, I research a lot of different witnesses, but, you know, there's a lot of different voices claiming today inside knowledge what's happening. Only Elena has, has an ongoing history that I've seen that, that no one without the direct knowledge could possibly know. And then later the information becomes public knowledge and verified, thus continuing to establish her credibility. Uh, most of, uh, a lot of what you've researched, uh, I've, I've pulled from Michael and some of my own uh, research as well, but there's about two dozen examples of corroboration and three of them just really stand out, showing scientifically verifiable evidence validated by space agencies on Earth before they had knowledge of these events, showing that Elena is receiving credible, accurate information. Uh, these three events, NASA substantiated it after she disclosed it. In uh, uh, February 2022, she identified three planets in Proxima Centauri two years before NASA was able to verify it with more advanced you know, telescopic abilities. And then Thorhan says, watch for activity on Neptune to be re revealed. Everybody's gonna be talking about Neptune. And two weeks later, uh, NASA substantiates down at the South Pole region, it starts heating up because of the space arcs, as you know. And then, uh, and then she contacted you by email, Michael, that uh, Thorhan was doing some terraforming operations on Mars, and he said they just had a huge quake at the Ares Prime base. And then one week later, they have a seismometer on Mars. It reported the largest quake ever detected on, in the solar system on Mars. So these are three examples that have been scientifically verified that there's just no way, you know, somebody can make this up. Um, well, Dan, I mean, we really are kind of like at the end of our time, so maybe we need to bring it to a, a close. So um, you've, you've just kind of like uh, that last PSYOP is the kind of like critical one in terms of like, uh, these advanced healing technologies, holographic uh, healing, uh, these exist, but they have been kept from the general public. But there, there is a plan in place to reveal this. Um, so, you know, just to kind of bring together what we've done and, and we'll have to meet again to continue our discussion and go to the next topic, which I think is an important one. Um, in, on this topic of you know, the, the 10 PSYOPs or 11, uh, any kind of final words you want to add to that? Oh, um, uh, we're maybe about two, three minutes to, to the end, um, if that oh, would work. Okay. okay. Um, well, well, yeah, I know, I know it's like one of these type of things that you and I have so much to say about all these uh, different elements. But, you know, as... You know, I've been in communication through via Elena to Thorhan's younger brother, who's a terraforming scientist uh, who's currently working on Mars. And uh, I joined you in October of uh, last year, presenting for the first time a frilled generator crystal to the public. Um, there are no more lies and deceptions, time for truth and liberation of our planet. Um, I uh, wanted to talk just briefly about some of the technology that Jen Han has shared. Uh, I can do this in less than two minutes. Um, the eye of the crystal to alter the holographic structure of reality. Jen Han has said how to cut the crystal. This is different than a Vogel crystal and how 
certain specifics and how it's cut to the hexagonal core of the crystal and where the two vortices that are formed they create this this phase conjunction node in the crystal which they call the eye of the crystal and it allows you to go into the void or any place in time and space any dimension density you can access through this um, he uh, said this is a way we can actually change the holographic structure of reality with our consciousness now if you stimulate this with a piezoelectric with which oscillates the uh the structure what it does is it uh opens this singularity vortex eye elaine and i this is elena's crystal and this is mine we set up set up with function generators where we're sending in compression waves with pulses into the vortex that's opening it up and as you remember john charles actually had an experience of uh or elena had the experience of him uh thinking of this japanese music that was actually playing through the open vortex that she had on her crystal but that's too long to go into now the frill generator crystal this is how they power their entire planet on the planet era and the pleiades this is their um older sister looks good for age um this we create it with my science team um it has toroid coils that are wound uh silver is wound counterclockwise the copper is wound clockwise or pulsed at a specific frequency and it oscillates and opens up the eye of the crystal to release the frill energy which on their planet what they do is they're able to convert this and transpond it across their planet and it powers all their devices it's also part of the mechanism they use in their starships uh the frill which we're attempting to develop it can be very healing it can go on your body and and it it removes the disharmonics that are in the oscillas oscillations of your of your body and that way it heals plants of course grow crazy um if people want to find out more marcelvogel.org we're developing it so it's optimized it still needs to be done and um and there we go we're done <laughs> all right well you know that's an incredible amount of information a lot to digest for people but i think uh, you've really laid out the the main psychological operations that are in play what they're covering up and you know ended up with i think a very positive um vision for what what is coming i mean these holographic crystal healing technologies is very exciting and I, and I think the whole age extension field is is just going to explode i mean everyone wants the possibility of being able to extend life and um and and regain their health and vitality and youth and all of that and mm -hmm. and the the fact that uh there's no reason why the physical bodies that we inhabit can't live to uh centuries or even a thousand years that mm -hmm. that they actually have that possibility and these technologies can kind of like open the door to that so that's that's very exciting and definitely uh, i'm sure people would love to hear more about uh the the crystal technology projects that you're working on with jen hand and elena and and kind of like what you have discovered and what you're developing yeah, we've had a little delay, you know, but we're, Elaine and I are going to pick it up and uh, talk to our, our friend on Mars <laughs> and uh, work with our science team on further optimizing we, with Una. She gave us a report that the output is, is feeble yet, uh, so we want to get it up to a robust level. And then we're doing it open source, giving it to the world freely. Um, you know, uh, Jen Han revealed to me that uh, uh, probably the reason I have an interest in the holographic medical beds is that uh, he revealed, I don't remember it, but I used to be a scientist in Atlantis that my specialty <laughs> was holographic medical technology. And so it's probably uh, why I'm, you know, I know this, this, this technology is real and the, uh, there's science behind it and it and it just makes it just makes sense that uh the lies and deceptions need to be revealed 
our complete medical system needs to be dismantled and these new healing modalities that can end so much suffering uh we brought out to to everyone and um and there's no worry about you know there's plenty of places to inhabit on this planet and there's other planets as well so i'm not i'm not concerned about overpopulation people people living to ripe old ages so dan where do people go if they want to get in touch with you or they want to read some of the material you've made available on on your website uh, uh, uh in his honor uh marcelvogel.org um has uh the, the the communication log which is like 150 pages of question and answer that uh you know has formed the understandings that we've gained from uh their science which is thousands of years ahead of our understanding and I, I know I'm at a kindergarten level, you know, compared to Jen Han, but uh, we've learned quite a bit. Okay, so marcelvogel.org and the uh, your your own personal website. Oh, on uh, you know, I need it needs updating, but the webmatrix.net. Perfect. Well, thank you, Dan. Uh, incredible amount of information there for people to digest. Uh, you're a wealth of wisdom, so thank you. Oh, my absolute pleasure. I know we ran off a little longer than expected, but how do you touch into the subject without going deeper? <laughs> thank you. Aloha. Aloha. You have been listening to Exopolitics Today with Dr. Michael Sala. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe to this channel. Join or start a conversation in the comments. Take the time to explore the vast library of best-selling books, webinars, and podcasts by Dr. Sala. Visit exopoliticstoday.com. Mm -hmm.